Thanks. Uh, I'm Jesse Burns from ISEC Partners. And I'm Peter Eckersley from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And uh, we're here to talk about uh, observing the SSLiverse. So this is a project uh, that both EFF and ISEC have been working on uh, thanks to some very generous assistance from the NLNAT Foundation. Uh, what we've done is we've downloaded a set of all the publicly visible uh, HTTPS SSL certificates and we're We've built a big database of them, and we're looking through to see what interesting things we can find. This is just a little overview of what we're going to talk about, uh, why we need the uh, observatory, and then uh, some of the results we found. Uh, we'll talk about uh, conclusions and future work at the end. Surprising that. So as you've probably realized at this point, HTTPS is a pretty important protocol. We do almost everything over the web. And the only hope that the web has to not get completely owned by everything is to encrypt itself and, and use uh, SSL. Uh, and HTTPS relies on certificates in order to ensure that the, the website you're talking to is actually the website you want to be talking to and not some, uh, some person in Bulgaria who's just put up a fake site uh, that looks a lot like the real one. Um, and the key component of this infrastructure for, for checking who you're talking to are certificate authorities. They're these people who go around and they sign certificates saying this public key really belongs to google.com. This public key really belongs to microsoft.com. This public key really belongs to your blog. Uh, and as you should imagine, anytime you hear the word authority, you should question it. Uh, um, uh, the best answer to authority is, is transparency and accountability. So we decided to apply some of that uh, to the existing uh, state of the CA world. Now there's a re reason why we're doing that as well. And that is there's been a, a growing amount of concern that the way that SSL uses certificate authorities is inherently problematic. Um, this is, uh, there's a, a growing amount of work of this kind. Um, uh, Chris Segoyan and Sid Stam recently uh, did some, but then last year there were three instances in which we observed attacks against HTTPS that were a result of mistakes or oversights by certificate authorities. Now, one of those was as simple as saying, we'll give a certificate to anyone who can answer, show that they answer administrative email at a domain. And here's a list of 20 email addresses at that domain, you know, root, uh, admin, administrator, postmaster, etc., etc. If you can answer any one of these, then we'll give you a certificate. And of course, out there on the web, there are some webmail providers who haven't reserved all of those names. So, um, but there are more. There are more sophisticated uh, attacks. So there's the um, attack by Sotorov et al., where they observe that some CAs use MD5 as part of their uh, their certification process, and then fail to randomize a serial number. Um, and so they were able to find an MD5 collision and also uh, predict the serial number so that they could make the MD5 collision work in practice against the CA. Um, and, and when that happens, it comp completely breaks HTTPS for everyone. Um, there was another example where certificate authorities were found to be put, signing uh, certificates that had slash zeros, zero bytes, inside the names of a, a, a of websites, and then of course, although the certificates use Pascal strings, so it's okay to have a zero byte in the middle of the string somewhere, uh, browsers you see, and and so they'd interpret that slash zero as the end of the string and, and add a different semantics. These attacks, unfortunately, may pertain only to one CA, but there are a lot of them, and the security you get for HTTPS is only as good as your weakest CA. And so it starts to matter how many of them there are and what they're really up to. And, and in a sense, our project, which we're going to report on today, or at least initially report on, is to try and find out who these CAs are and what they're up to. Uh, so we're going to, we download everything and uh, see what we can learn from the results. All right. So. Uh our uh, observatory has a little bit of infrastructure. It actually, uh, we didn't need a lot of stuff to do this, but we did need a little patience. So we had three low-end Linux servers with only two gigs of RAM each, um, a good shared 100 megabit network connection uh, with uh, people that were um, uh, supportive, uh, NMAP with uh, poor timing settings, um, some Python code, and uh, some time. 
So we uh, ran this thing and uh, we did all the analysis, or most of the analysis, on a single uh, year old uh, i920 uh, CPU with a fast disk and a lot of RAM um, and two little laptops. So uh, tying together OpenSSL, uh, a MySQL database, and uh, lots of uh, little Python scripts. Um, currently, we unfortunately, uh, our community contribution is vaporal, um, but we intend on making a distribution of uh, our database. We have a little problem where we've uncovered some vulnerabilities and we need to finish uh, all our disclosure before we can uh, do that. Yeah, so put it another way, hopefully in a few weeks uh, we'll have a, a website up at EFF or a page up at EFF where you can download the entire data set that we got here and, and see if you can improve on our findings. It'll be a big BitTorrent download. And also some little web forms where you can say enter a domain and see, okay, these are the, all the certificates that were observed in other we in weird shady parts of the internet that claim to, uh, uh, to answer for that domain. So the first thing we did, uh, we said, well, we need to know where the SSL servers are. Uh, and so some people in the, there have been some pre-existing projects that have gone looking for them by say compiling a list of the top one million names uh, and re resolving them and then going to see if they answer over HTTPS. We took a sort of more brute force approach. Uh, we contacted every IPv4 address on port 443 using Nmap, sent it a SYN, uh, and if it came back with an ACK, we just jotted down that fact. We did this with these little um, work units of the form, you know, number dot star dot star dot number. Uh, it's a bit like the work units used for SETI at home, except instead of ob observing the sky, we're observing SSL. Um, you need to do that so that if something crashes halfway through, you don't have to start the whole scan again at the beginning. So you have the work units you've done and the ones that are still remaining. And then once we've seen an IP address reply, uh, we then jot down that and come back later with a little Python script that will uh, send it an SSL hello message and just record the reply that it gets. Um, um, one of the things that's kind of nice about this moment in time, it's 2010, it's perhaps the last time that you can reasonably take this approach. Um, we're running out of IPv4 address space. IPv6 is 128 bits. We're not going to be uh, sending SINs to uh, each of those. And uh, there's these new technologies that are improving the internet, uh, like server name uh, indication, uh, SNI, and uh, Spidey and other uh, protocols that uh, extend SSL and make it so that when you say hello to a server and ask it for its certificate chain, you have to know who it is that you want to talk to before it tells you who it is. Uh, that will make our lives harder. Yeah, another way of saying that is currently virtual hosting doesn't really work for HTTPS. It does work for modern browsers, but anyone who's deploying a website needs to support, you know, IA7, IA6, all these, these, these uh, legacy browsers. And until those are gone, you can't do virtual hosting in SSL. And so in a sense, we're relying on that um, in order to make this work. Extraction and certificates. So maybe what we could have, uh, or maybe what we could have done would have been uh, E easier if we'd have used something off the shelf, but what we decided to do was write a custom uh, client uh, in it with Python and construct. And uh, part of the idea there was that we might have bugs in our understanding of the TLS protocol, but we want the bugs, the parsing errors to be bugs that we could understand. That was really important to us. So we didn't have to implement all of TLS in order to do this. Uh, just these little parts uh, I've outlined here. And uh, that allows us to detect failures. Uh, we went off the RFC definitions, and then we just had to kind of debug it with Wireshark and some test cases. Um, turns out that the RFC is a little ambiguous here and there, and uh, you really have to dig around to find some places that work. Um, but once we did that, we were able to uh, collect SSL certificates without actually having to do the key agreement part. So that's very efficient. You just say hello, and it sends back some bytes, and you drop the connection when you see that they've given you everything you need to reconstruct their whole certificate chain. Uh, you don't even uh, need to uh, do any key agreement uh, stuff at all. So we yeah, can't. No crypto math. Basically. Yeah, no crypto. So it's nice and quick. And then if we make a mistake, we can go back after the fact and reanalyze. So at the end of, end of this process, we are left with a big pile of X509 certificates. And as an aside or a reminder, it's worth dwelling on what X509 actually is. Uh, it's a standard, or at least a, a recommendation, that was promulgated by the International Telecommunications Union, the sort of the international club of telcos, in the 1980s, uh, back before the web existed and SSL existed. Um, and the general advantage that the protocol has is that it's amazingly flexible and extensible. It's completely abstract, completely general, you can do anything with it. 
these are also its disadvantages. And so the, the, the fact that it was able to be kind of retrospectively bolted onto the web uh, is maybe a testament to its flexibility and also perhaps it, it might not, it, we might have been better served with a, a, a lean, narrowly defined way to do encryption for the web, but instead what we have is this, this, um, this complicated infrastructure uh, that has a lot of security features that are hard to understand, especially when you start to take the intersection of all of them. So we have these things. Um, we need to parse them. And we don't, there's no real right way to parse X509 certificates. I mean, there's ways that they say to do it in the specs, but one of the things that we're really interested in is how maybe two different implementations might look at an X509 certificate and see something different in there, like the great example of those nulls. Um, uh, so we uh, didn't, uh, you know, uh, want to uh, try and write it the right way. What we did was we decided to uh, do it uh, one of the wrong ways that was fairly easy and gave us a lot of data fast. And uh, that was to use uh, OpenSSL's uh, X509 text pretty printer and then to parse that. And we've actually experimented with some other ways of doing this um, because obviously there's information that uh, shows up in certificates that uh, your C client might not be the best thing to see. Um, you can use a Java server or a certificate parser. You can write your own code uh, very similar to the uh, OpenSSL uh, verify command or the OpenSSL X509 command. All that source is available. It's easy to see how they're doing that and make your own little tweaked versions. Um, but ideally, we want to have different views of the certificates, and then we can agree on fingerprints, which is just the hash of the Dur encoded bytes of the certs, which should never change. And we can join all that together and uh, you know, conduct our analyses to see maybe which views are different. So in order to analyze this data that we just paused, uh, we put it all in a gigantic set of MySQL tables. Um, and then as we, uh, we noticed interesting questions that we wanted to ask or interesting properties we wanted to examine, like the relationship between domain names, like there might be many certs that in different ways claim to be relevant to a particular domain. Um, you want to build separate tables to, to capture those mappings. Um, and then once you've built this big MySQL infrastructure, basically a question that you want to ask about the uh, the state of SSL turns into a fancy query you can write. And we have a couple of examples of these um, later on in the slides. And then once, we, once we're ready to publish this data, hopefully you can all go out and write your own uh, queries against this data set. Um, and in a way, this approach is sort of, it gives us the flexibility that you need to handle all of the, the crazy internal complexity you've got inside X509. Um, and then the first thing that we did with this set of tables was try to work out which of the, um, uh, the certificates was valid. And that turned out to be quite tricky. Um, it's very important and there are some more but perhaps not all of the gory details later. But what we found in general was, okay, there are 16.2 million machines on the internet, at least when we scanned, that replied on port 443 with a, an ACK. And then of those, if you actually looked at what they said back to you, 10.8 million or thereabouts of them gave an SSL response. The others, who knows what they were. They were random bytes that they came back with. Um, and then of the 10.8 SSL handshakes, 4.3 or so million of those had a valid SSL search chain. The others were self-signed, expired, invalid in some way. And then if you look at the valid ones, a lot of them are the same chain repeated on multiple IP addresses. So you get down to 1.3 uh, million valid leaves um, if you want to count, uh, count well, throw away the, the repeated uh, chains. Which is uh, very close to the number of valid certificates. So there's a few uh, extra ones in there we'll talk about later. So uh, a little crash course on what it means to be a valid um, X509 certificate chain. Um, when you put up a website uh, running HTTPS and you just serve up the, uh, the certificate you got signed by a CA, um, that'll often work because the trust root uh, chain is already that chain, the subordinate CA that signed your uh, browser or your certificate is uh, already uh, present in the browser. Um, usually though you send back a trust chain. So you send a couple of uh, certificates back and then the browser orders those and figures out um, if, uh, if, if this chain really maps back to a trust route. The trust route is what grants you the authority. So this is a really important process so I just want to give you the dirty version of it. Um, when you 
check a link in the chain, you check that the issuer on the, chain, on the certificate you're looking at matches the subject of its parent. If there are these authority and subject key IDs in either of them, then they must match. Uh, you check that the dates are valid and you check that the key usage is correct. So uh, this isn't a code signing thing that I'm doing. This is an SSL chain that I'm verifying. I don't want to see your code signing certain here, thanks. Um, and then you also have to look and make sure that there's no critical property, something flagged in that certificate that you don't understand what it means. Because maybe that means, hey, this certificate isn't uh, valid for you. And that's, that stops us from um, missing important uh, extensions that we need to be able to grok. That's a great question and it would be a really easy uh, bunch of SQL queries to do. So either if we, uh, we're not going to finish this talk early probably, but if we finish <laughs> it early we could have done the, the SQL queries for you, shown, shown you live on the screen. Uh, failing that we can come and do it in the, we can go and do it in the breakout session or once the data set is public it'll be pretty easy for, for you guys to just go and, uh, and look at those properties yourself. He's pretty good at quickly turning those into pictures too. So. Um, so this is a, there's a big partition out there between valid and invalid sets. And there are a few, few that we had to, that were on the gray line in between that we had to struggle with as we, we learned a bit more about this. One example that we discovered is that sometimes a certificate, whether a certificate is valid in Firefox or not, depends on what other sites you've been to beforehand. Uh, that was non-intuitive, but uh, what happens is whenever Firefox sees a subordinate or intermediate CA that it considers valid, it caches it. And so, uh, and that's sort of, you know, part of, like part of the system, you know, those things are valid if they're signed by a root you trust, so you cache them. And so sometimes a chain will depend on an intermediate or subordinate CA that it doesn't contain. And so if you've already cached that, that middle cert when you go to the site, it's valid. If you haven't already cached it, it isn't. So this is crazy stuff like this. But aside from that thin gray line in the middle, you've got a world of black and white. And in the black world, the invalid world, there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on. Um, there are lots of certs out on the internet that claim to be Microsoft, claim to be Google, claim to be Star. Um, there are things that look like telcos in Southeast Asian countries. Uh, man in, maybe, maybe, maybe they're, they're man in the middling the users. More likely what it is is that they have a WAP gateway, which is you know, the old mobile internet thing, and, and those require you to, uh, to impersonate. Yeah, to impersonate the server because they didn't have proper infrastructure for TLS in there. Um, so there's all this crazy stuff out there. But most of this talk, unless otherwise noted, is about the white certs. The certs that are valid that check out when you go to them with a modern Firefox or IE um, and they give you the little lock icon. And what kind of questions do we want to ask about them? How many are there? Who are they? What do they sign? Is anyone impersonating anyone? So the number of uh, trusted CAs is kind of a tricky question. So if we're going to figure out uh, who browsers trust, we want to know what the trust routes are. And um, if you just fire up those browsers, maybe you look in your Mozilla trust route, you see 124 trust routes representing around 60 organizations. That's, that's you know, some indication. When you fire up Windows 7, open up IE, you see uh, 19 trust routes. And you think, oh, wow, those guys have really tightened that down. Um, Except. Uh, what Microsoft actually does is uh, when you're going to a website and uh, your browser doesn't instantly check out, the, it doesn't check out the root isn't in your, your list of 19, IE actually goes and pings Microsoft and says, so should I really trust this root CA? And Microsoft has a list of about 300 of these certs that they might give you. And uh, they come from 100 or so controlling organizations. So one really nasty thing about this user interface is if you care about who you trust and you go and look at the IE list, you don't get the real list. You get this little sanitized version of it. Uh, and so we had to go and get the sorted, the real sorted complete IE list uh, and use that as the... Although, to be fair, they do document this whole process and actually provide a lot of insight as to what they'll do if... Um, say breaks like the break that just happened last year happens to SHA-1. They have a whole plan for what they're going to do with uh, eliminating uh, c certificate authorities say that don't bother to randomize their serial number. Right? Sorry. So they'll invalidate them long before they'll uh, invalidate people that properly uh, invalidate them. I didn't mean to call Microsoft sorted. 
Um, so how many of these things are there? I mean, obviously, you've got this, this, this set of roots that Microsoft and Firefox trust explicitly. But then, of course, because so many of these are delegated and have the power to create new CA certificates, there's actually a larger set that we found. Um, there are 1,482 that were valid for either Windows and Firefox. Now, remember, these are often multiple certs controlled by one organization, so the large number in and of itself isn't necessarily a, you know, damning. In fact, it's good practice to keep your most powerful keys off the internet and then have one that has a shorter expiry date, uh, perhaps on a server somewhere where you're actually signing things. <laughs> but um, if you say how many issuer strings, which is the kind of magic thing that you look up the cert by, uh, are there? There are 1,100. And if you look inside the issuer, there's a field that says organization. Um, and if you sometimes. Uh, if you count those plus, you know, some, some fallback options, you get about 650 organizations that have the power to create, to sign a cert that your browser will trust to be google.com. Uh, now, some of those organizations might be owned by some of the others, um, and the jurisdictions that they work in might overlap. It's complicated, but the general principle that you should remember underlying all of this is that if a CA cert can sign one domain, it can sign every domain on the internet. So each CA has many certificates, but the combination of the issuer and the authority key ID, that, which is actually the um, subject key ID in the uh, issuer's cert, that's a unique combination. So you can look at uh, the top CAs that we found in use on the internet. Some, these are valid uh, signatures. We found uh, one GoDaddy cert. Uh, this is its uh, fingerprint here. It signed 300,000 um, uh, different uh, CA or certificates. Uh, the next uh, biggest one was Equifax. They signed uh, 244,000. Uh, when you get down to thought, you find one that doesn't have a, a subject key ID in it, which means that when you're looking it up, you have to look for every certificate in your trust route that has that issuer name, and that can take a lot of time because you need to try, you know, if there's multiple keys in there, you have to do expensive PKI or public key operations uh, for each of those to validate that uh, it's true, and if one isn't uh, correct, maybe the next one is, so you have to keep trying. Uh, and then, uh, you know, 85,000 plus from uh, user trusts for certs, all with the same skid, which is kind of a strange thing. Um, it's possible that when you're doing certificate revocation, you might want to uh, have kind of different domains. Uh, it's a really uh, a weird uh, kind of world to see which ones have uh, unique keys and which ones have unique uh, skids. So. Um, one of the things about these validity uh, assumptions here is that we're doing this with OpenSSL uh, and a version of OpenSSL that uh, isn't too fussy about, uh, you know, MD5. Uh, it's a little bit older. And uh, ones that are valid based on the Firefox trust routes or on all the IE ones that you get. And uh, you can just download those. And we have uh, a contributor who did that. Oh, SCID. SCID is the uh, subject key identifier. It's an X509 v3 option. Uh, they showed up in like 1998. I'll talk about them a little more later, but it's one of the things that if it's present, they have to match. If it isn't present, they don't have to match. And it should be the keys identifier. In fact, there's a suggestion that maybe it's the SHA-1 hash of the key, but it doesn't have to be. Oh, yeah, that's a great question, actually. So, um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, the question was, uh, how do you know that we have all the Microsoft ones? Maybe they have secret ones. So, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on here where certificate, like trust routes, sign subordinates. And those subordinates have the same powers, basically, as the root, right? They can sign anything they want. They can sign other subordinates. Um, you know, you can uh, see how sometimes trust routes will actually say when you ask them, oh, could you tell us all of your uh, subordinate CAs you've signed? Oh, that's private information. Um, you know, that, that's sort of... Uh, so, so maybe a better, a, di a different interpretation of what you, what you might have meant to ask. Um, what we did is we, we uh, like, one of, actually an ISEC intern got a version of XP, installed all the service packs, uh, and this was before Windows had completely rolled out its, uh, its magic update to the cert, and so you actually got all the certs, or a very large list of certs. We can't be sure that we got all of them. We, we got a very large list of, of certs that Microsoft would push as updates to Windows XP, but uh, we can't be sure we've got, got that entire set. Uh, and it's almost certain that there are some certs in, in private domains um, that we can't see, and also that Microsoft could indeed, if, if they got a court order and decided it was, it was uh, 
was valid, which is a separate question, they could add another, silently add another cert um, to their set of trust routes and, and we might never know. Uh, you know, actually, any of these trust routes can do this, though. That was my point, right? You don't have to worry about Microsoft. You can worry about, uh, you know, this uh, funny company in the UAE that has one, right? They can do the same thing, and uh, they don't need to add anything to your trust route, and it's even kind of better because you don't see it in the trust route there. If Microsoft added a root cert, as soon as someone started using it, it'd become visible in your browser, and you'd be able to see that's the chain, right? These intermediate ones are a little bit sneakier. Um, I, I think we better not take any more questions right now because we've got a lot of material to cover. <laughs> not a lot of time. I, yep. I, I, just pop this for one sec. This uh, is an example of the top 14 certs that are actually used to sign leaves on the internet. And uh, you can see that uh, a lot of them are signed by the first two and then it kind of trickles off and then that big uh, gray area there is the other. And uh, you know, it gets kind of messy at the end. So a different way of breaking that down, this was literally which, which certs were sort of immediately signing things. This is counting by root CAs. So not just what is signed directly by the root CA, but what is signed by the entire tree of things following it. And, and, and the 340 or so that are, 343 that exists between Firefox and Windows. And so you see this extremely skewed distribution. In fact, you can't really see what's going on in this graph. So we made a log version of it um, and cheated a little bit. Actually, that's zero, not one. But you can't have zero on a log scale. Um, and uh, so what you can see here is that about half of these root CAs aren't signing anything. That might be because they're code signing certs that aren't used for signing uh, SSL leaf nodes. And so when you, do an, uh, when you look at the SSL verse, that's not what you see. But uh, some of them are definitely um, SSL signing search. Yeah, so some of these, uh, and some of them might be new certs that are about to be deployed, but, but generally speaking, half of the, 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 the certs we trust don't sign anything. And then there's another small group that sign one, two, three, four, up to 10, and then gradually you start to get certs that are of significance. Um, so I, we don't want to provide specific interpretation for this graph yet, but it, it is quite interesting that it has this, this shape. Um, we just actually talked about some of these. Yeah, I'll blow through this quick, but um, there's this good case for a leaf to be unused, which is that when you have a more secure certificate, you need to push it out there. Uh, so I've got this new trust route. It's signed with a bigger key than the old one. It's got a nice late expiration date. I'm going to put it out there. I'm not going to sign anything with it until it's been widely adopted by all the different browser vendors. That's totally a legitimate case, and it actually improves the overall security of the system. Uh, so you know, you can't just say, oh, this isn't used. It's bad. Um, also, you might need a backup route, perhaps. Um, where it gets a little less legitimate is when you're thinking about subordinate CAs. Uh, I'm not uh, sure why these would be unused. Uh, it seems like uh, if you've got subordinate CAs, um, you know, those are pretty easy to get reissued uh, as evidenced by the uh, hundreds of them that have been issued. Um, it seems like that you know, backup planning uh, revocation should be an easier story for those. So if anyone has any good arguments for that, I'd love to hear it in questions. Uh, so do you want to actually do it? Yeah, sure, sure. So, um, Many valid uh, CA certs share keys. So this is a funny thing. You've got this cert. It gives some authority. Maybe it's a CA cert. It's good for a period of time, and it's got some power, like it can be used for signing SSL certificates. Um, and you know, you've got another one right beside it. And oh, that's funny. They have the same key, which means if you break certificate A, you broke certificate B, right? You can impersonate one with the other. So fortunately, we didn't see any valid uh, CA keys that were used in non-CA keys, because that would be uh, terrifying. It would imply that you know some little edge sitting on the uh, uh, on a web server somewhere was uh, uh, sitting with a real uh, uh, CA cert, and all you'd have to do is pop that thing, and you'd uh, be uh, in a good spot to do some harm. Um, we identified 80 distinct keys that were used in multiple CA certs, and the most widely reused one was this Verisign key from 2006. It's a strong 2048-bit key. Um, the, uh, shirts, the certs all share a subject, but, uh, and they lack subject or authority IDs. Uh, four of them, uh, there's only, uh, uh, yeah, four of these keys all expire simultaneously in 2021. But one of them doesn't expire until 2036. So when you look at that, you think like, um, what, what, what is going on here? Why is it okay for these first ones to uh, last only till 2021, but that last one till 2036? And you, you see a lot of interesting behavior like that. Um, so another uh, place we looked at this was, um, you know, here's, a, here's just another example of this phenomenon. So 
the, these keys were shared between uh, an organization. So we see uh, Certificate 1 and Certificate 2. Certificate 2 is um, a, a Komodo cert from the UK, and Certificate 1 is an Optimum SSL cert from the United States. And these two separate entities, or two separate organizations, have the same key in their uh, cert. So maybe they own each other. Um, they have simultaneous expiration, so it seems like they're designed to kind of be considered valid for the same period of time. The business interests of these entities are obviously intimately aligned because they're sharing key material. So um, they have the same SKIDs and ACIDs and key usages. Uh, it's a really uh, weird thing. Uh, whenever you have two countries uh, or two organizations with one public key, it's kind of a fun uh, example to look at because you know that there's uh, something going on here. And uh, the issuing uh, authority here is uh, user trust. So obviously, whoever that is, they're cool with those two people being uh, sharing their private keys. So here's another example where um, we've got uh, three different certificates all sharing a key. Um, the two SHA-1 fingerprints of the certificates in question um, are, uh, oh yeah, sorry, so those SHA-1s are just the SHA of the Dur encoding, so you can look them up. Um, you've got two different countries here uh, and uh, two organizations with one public key. Uh, the issuing authority is, interestingly enough, user trust again, and so we've got, you know, this uh, positive software in Komodo now sharing stuff across countries with their light SSL. Um, the neat thing about this is that certificates one and two expire in 2020, uh, and um, number three expires 10 months earlier. Um, two and three actually share start dates, but um, over 44,000 certs are using this key ID. So. So, some CAs are using these shared keys to delay the expiration of their certificates. So just looking from number two here, you can tell that this short key has been used before um, and uh, how long it's been available to attackers. Um, VeriSign had a 1,024-bit key shared by four certs with a total lifetime of 7,000 days. When extensions were created for that key, the new key was kept, uh, like at the old start time, so that examining trust routes would give the user an accurate understanding of how long the attackers have had to brute force this key. It's not a very strong key, it's only 1,024 bits. The key start date is from 1997, which is before uh, ACIDs and SKIDs started showing up, those uh, key uh, identif identifiers that make validation more efficient. Um, so this little trick here is adding 2,392 days to this uh, key's life lifetime, which was only supposed to be 6,000 days uh, originally. So kind of, uh, I don't know if that's uh, bad, but it's, it's interesting. And it's a policy decision that you can only um, sort of uh, start thinking about when you look at all the different keys that are out there and all the subordinate keys. And the subordinate keys aren't always uh, visible to you because when you look in the trust routes, it doesn't tell you what all the subordinates are. All right, I want to do this one too. So one of my little uh, bugbears is that um, when you're using SSL, you've got this idea. You've got a user that wants to connect to something and they should know kind of what that is. Like maybe I want to talk to Google or maybe I want to talk to EFF or to Peter, right? So um, there's a meeting of minds though between me, between the certificate authority that asserts that Peter is who he says he is and Peter, right? So I connect to him. Um, this uh, RFC 1918 defines our nice little reserved IP addresses like the 10 and 192.168 space. Um, there's CAs out there that are handing out these addresses in, as certs. So they're saying, oh yeah, you're the real 192.168.2.1 or .1.2. So US Equifax asserts that that address uh, is in Texas and uh, Belgian Global Sign uh, actually puts it in the US too. Oh, but also in the UK and in Switzerland and in Belgium. Oh, and it also says that that's also 77.76.108.82. So you might not have known all that. Anyway, uh, I uh, think, uh, you know, that's a terrible thing when you see people signing uh, IP addresses that are in reserve spaces. Uh, they also sign on qualified names, and that's kind of cute. Uh, we found one CA was uh, signing, uh, Komodo signed like uh, 6,000 of these uh, local host certs. Um, and this is actually the most common valid certificate on the internet by name, uh, local host. Um, and some CAs, like um, CyberTrust, Ntrust, Equifax, and Microsoft and VeriSign uh, actually only signed one cert that we saw with the name localhost. Almost like they kept track of the names that they were assigning, like, <laughs> which means these other ones are obviously... Yeah, uh, of course, in addition to localhost, you've got mail and, you know, yeah. lots of other kind of natural LAN names that shouldn't really be... Uh 
the subjective sets. So, uh, yeah. This so, oh yeah, some countries aren't even using their own CAs. So we found that uh, uh, Macau has its own 2048-bit uh, uh, CA that's in XP, but it doesn't use them. It doesn't even use a Chinese or a Portuguese CA. It uses, uh, it signs its government's websites with commercial certificates from US and UK companies. Um, so there are, there are some funny weak sets out there. Uh, there are some that have 508-bit uh, RSA keys. Um, just a couple of those, but they were valid. Uh, that those are the fingerprints, or at least portions of them. Um, and there are some vulnerabilities um, and other weird things. So the the biggest thing we found, what we did is got a table of the uh, blacklist. Um, of keys that resulted from the Debian OpenSSL bug. Debian had this bug that was present from 2006 to 2008 where their random number generator in SSL wasn't functioning correctly because of an attempt to, to fix a bug that wasn't really there. Um, the end result was that only 15 to 17 bits of entropy in OpenSSL's keys on that platform at that time, which means that those private keys are not private. You can just go and make a list of them all. They're, they're public private keys. So if you see one of these keys in use on the internet, it means that anyone uh, can just go and jump into that SSL session and start messing around. And so here's a little query, effectively, that, that tells you, you know, select subject from certs, join against the blacklist, you know, where the SHA-1 of your cert is the same as the, the hash in the blacklist. And what do you find? Well, there are 28,000 certificates on the internet that have this bug in them. Uh, 28,000 certificates where the, the private key isn't private. Um, fortunately, only 500 of those 28,000 are actually valid. So we're not talking about quite as, as much of a problem. But of the other 28,000, 12,000 of those are CA certs. Um, so unfortunately, probably what, what's going on with some of those is that they're being used for private PKIs inside organizations. Um, and those organizations need to really replace uh, their infrastructure really, well, two years ago. Uh, it's sort of bad that this is still happening. And really, okay, people can be excused for messing up and using an old version of something on their machines, but CAs cannot be excused for signing certificates for known weak keys. And they can't be excused for failing to revoke the certificates they've signed when they have a straightforward list that they could check against. Now, there are some CAs that did okay by this measure. Um, Starfield, five out of five, revoked the certificates that, that had the blacklist uh, keys. Komodo got 29 out of 30. I don't know what happened to that 30th one. Um, it's actually kind of an important server. I'm, I'm not going to say anything about what it is but, uh, until it's fixed, but uh, it's kind of bad that that 30th is there. Um, user trust similarly. And some CAs did a really bad job. Equifax, none out of 140 of the weak keys were revoked. Uh, Cybertrust got four out of 125, which presumably means they were revoked for reasons other than the weakness of the key, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we just discovered this a day or two ago. We were finally like, cramming our slides together. Once we've had time to contact the people who, who need to switch out these keys, uh, then we'll be ready to actually publish the database. We don't want to do that before uh, uh, that's done. There are also some other weird kinds of certificates out there. If you go looking at, like all sorts of other queries you can ask and you get something strange. So here's an example of one. Now, this is a slight stylization of the SQL query, but it's approximately how it works. And what it's asking is it's saying, do valid certificates agree? There are two parts of a certificate that pertain to whether it's a CA or not. Actually more, I'm simplifying when I say there are only two parts. But there's one part that says, am I a CA, true or false? Um, and there's another part that says, what is this key used for? And one of the, the, the flags that can be in the key usage field is signing certificates. And so these two fields should agree. Um, there is precisely one valid certificate on the internet where they do not agree. Um, uh, it was, uh, it's a certificate that's marked as not a CA, and yet when you look inside the key usage field, it says it's allowed to sign certificates. Now, I have no idea whether all clients process the certificate correctly. Perhaps they do, uh, but it should never have been signed in the first place. It was signed by uh, Quivadis, um, the CA based in Bermuda, and I guess they do things liberally in Bermuda. Um, 
So we decided also to create some pretty pictures uh, of the set of CAs uh, and which ones sign subordinate and intermediate CAs for each other. What does, you know, what does that look like? Uh, and so feed all of that data set into graphviz and you get this. That's not pretty. <laughs> it's not pretty and it's kind of hard to see on this screen. So maybe we can try to zoom in. That's, a, that's a, not even a root CA, that's an intermediate CA that signed a lot of things, mostly universities in Germany, 247 of them. Um, uh, but you still can't see very much. You couldn't see what that name was from this graph, but you keep zooming in. There's, it, it's hard to see what's going on. Uh, so if we have time, which we probably won't, maybe in the breakout session, we can let you zoom in and fly around this graph and see all the gory details. Yeah, there's a lot of complicated things here, and uh, it's not very instructional, unfortunately. But um, we can uh, sit back and take a look at some of the more interesting subordinate CAs. Um, the, some of the ones that we saw that we thought were kind of cool was uh, I didn't know that the, the DHS had a subordinate CA cert. And uh, it, you know, it does and that's, you know, it operates an organization and I'm sure they signed up all the paperwork and we didn't see them doing anything abusive with it for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that they had that. I didn't know that I was trusting them. Um, CCNIC, um, <laughs> I mean, I know that I trust them, but I uh, didn't know I was trusting them in my browser. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, that's what I meant to say. Uh, then there's also the CNNIC, which there was a, or, uh, sorry. Uh, Maybe CNNIC, that's yes. mistyped. Uh, sorry. Uh, that uh, had this subordinate CA that uh, in 2009 that got added to the trust route and a lot of people uh, got excited about it. And it turns out that we found a, uh, so it had been signed by a subordinate uh, CA in 2007, so you already trusted it before you had the whole fight over whether or not you're going to trust it, so that's good. Um, and uh, then there's this company, uh, Tela, I, I which is a, a company in the United Arab Emirates. This isn't our discovery at all, you know, thanks at least to Chris Segoy and maybe other people before that for observing. This company uh, uh, was known to have installed malware on the Blackberries of 100,000 of its customers, um, and yet it's trusted by all of the world's browsers to sign uh, any domain. Um, and it's not trusted explicitly, it's trusted indirectly because other people have signed it. So you send a little malware uh, and uh, then people keep bugging you about it for years. It's uh, terrible, poor guys. Uh, anyway, uh, UAE doesn't uh, otherwise have uh, any CAs operating in its country too, so that's its court's like little uh, wedge on uh, signing stuff. So. Great. Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, I, uh, I like them because I met a cool guy there at a conference and he was giving a great talk about how uh, you can use uh, web attacks and because uh, he does that for his work and uh, it's good. But don't worry, he's uh, doing it for the government so it's all legal. Um, Gemini, uh, they're an observatory and uh, hey, I want to see you, sir. That'd be cool. Um, and then lots of... We're an observatory too. Yeah, yeah, totally. Come on. Uh, so uh, companies, uh, Dell, Ford, Google, Marks and Spencer, Vodafone, some of those, you know, it makes a lot of sense that Google has a CA cert. They have a lot of stuff on the internet and, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, but Ford, I, I was a little surprised by that one. Uh, and then there's hundreds more. It's kind of fun. So subordinate CAs, countries with valid CAs. We saw about 46 uh, countries with valid CAs. The most uh, prominent by uh, CAs were the United States, South Africa, because of thought. Um, the UK, Belgium, Japan, Germany, the Netherlands, and Israel. Uh, those top 10 countries each had over 10K valid certificates that uh, we saw that were signed with their certs. Um, through subordinate CAs, uh, the following countries didn't appear to have uh, a root CA, but they kind of gained a CA. So the UAE doesn't have a CA for its country, a root CA, but it has a subordinate CA in its jurisdiction, so maybe its courts can uh, ask uh, them to give them little uh, uh, spying uh, permission or something. Uh, same with Iceland, Luxembourg, Max Macedonia, Malaysia, and uh, the Russian Federation. Um, yeah, so 64 routes didn't include a country. Most of those are probably US based. Um, uh, if you have a big company in the US, maybe they don't feel like they have to say what country they're in because, you know, they're big. And then uh, a little bit about the unwashed self-signed masses. So some people choose to use self-signed certs and it's arguably quite reasonable. If you don't need uh, a trusted introducer, why pay for it? And uh, you know, then adopt all that complexity of the CA infrastructure. Uh, the cost and complexity of the model should then be lower and uh, you know, the, it's already widely used for SSH, which is what we use to install our certs. So in principle, it kind of reduces your attack surface by eliminating the risk of random subordinates or trust routes, asserting that they're your webmail server. In practice, though, it's a lot trickier. Uh, for one, certificates can have multiple names. 
and uh, we wouldn't want to have to or take one uh, from uh, one website and have it used on another. Uh, modern browsers like IE, Firefox, and Chrome all track what sites self-signed certs were approved for. Uh, so even if subject alternate names also want to approve start.google.com or some other sensitive domain, the cert won't be accepted for those. Um, Firefox even provides this nice UI um, that lets you go through and see those, uh, and uh, that might make you think that you could start implementing some of this tofu or persistence of key. Sorry, tofu is trust on first use. Uh, it's kind of like the SSH security model. Uh, you know, but uh, unfortunately, even in that browser, when you um, go to a site, you say, yeah, this is the cert I want to use to identify it. I accept that, permanently store it. Um, and then someone serves up a different certificate with a trust, uh, tr a name that validates to a trust root. It, uh, it lets that uh, replace it. So. It means you're, you better not have self-signed certs for uh, mail or 192.168.1.2 because attackers with real CA signed certs, which they can get anywhere they want, uh, could easily impersonate them. Um, so there's a big picture question here, which is, okay, we've seen that there is far too much trust, far too much promiscuous trust out there in the SSL universe. Um, and it obviously leads you to, to ask, so, so is HTTPS fundamentally broken here? Like, what's going on? Um, and I don't want to reach for that easy answer to say yes. Actually, despite all the Baroque complexity, um, this system seems to be working surprisingly well for how bad it is. And it, <laughs> in particular, we went looking for, we, we used one method to look for server impersonation or you know, your man in the middle and other kinds of ser uh, server impersonation attacks. The method we used was, okay, if you see a name that has multiple certs signing for it, like google.com, is there sometimes a case where one of the certs signing for it is an obscure one that hardly signs for anything? Um, and certainly some of those exist, but none of them look obviously like they're malicious. Uh, they might be, but uh, we haven't tested that. So, so if there is, CA certified uh, server impersonation stuff going on, either it's being done with the same kinds of widely used CA keys that, that everyone is using, this, that, that small tail that signs a lot of stuff, um, and certainly there is going to be some that, that's like that, uh, or it's being deployed in a non-public way. You know, you can't just go and see it happening by pinging port 443 uh, on a public IP address. Uh, you have to be on the right private network and then it happens to you see the magic cert at that moment. Um, and talk more about what we're planning to do to try and see some of that, get a window into some of that stuff in the future. Um, but the question is, can we do any better? And that's, it's not clear yet that we can. Um, in particular, there are other systems that seem to work pretty well, like SSH. But the fundamental thing about SSH is when a server's key changes, if you have a shell on that machine, you should have some way of finding out why the key changed and whether the new one's correct. Like maybe you're the admin or Maybe you can call the admin, at least, uh, and say, hey, is that key, key changing? Or you know that the machine crashed. So that model, the Tofu model works for SSH and other kind of small world deployments. It's not clear that it works if you're trying to visit a website on the other side of the world. You know, you're in, in Nigeria and you're a legitimate user of an online shopping site in the United States, whatever. Um, and, and similarly, there are other protocols like uh, OTR instant messaging does great key authentication, uh, but it's hard to see how you could use that for the web. Um, so what we want to do in the future, certainly as soon as we've, we've done disclosure, we're going to be releasing the data set we've got this far. We're thinking about adding uh, Firefox, ex adding functionality to various Firefox extensions to spot unusual or unseen certificates. Uh, in particular, something like Tor Button or something like HTTPS Everywhere could have an option you can turn on that says, hey, in the background, check all my certs through Tor. Go through Tor and see if I'm seeing the publicly visible cert or not. And if I'm not, then go back through Tor again and send an anonymous report with this cert to our observatory. Um, so we're thinking about implementing stuff like that and, and who knows what, what we'll find. Uh, maybe that'll be a DEF CON talk next year. Um, and then maybe uh, we could put together some metrics to uh, get a better picture of uh, CA importance, right? There's a few legitimate reasons to have uh, minimally used CAs, but I'd like to uh, may be able to maybe explain to people why they can cut one or uh, why they can cut many. Um, so uh, do we have time for like one or two questions? Well, we do have a question from Senator Green from 
All right, All right. 113. So questions will be in room 113.